Okay, guys, so this lecture is allocated for precipitation strengthening. Do you guys have any idea what is the difference between precipitation strengthening or hardening with solute solution hardening? Any right. idea? Other this than the method, Sujin? Uh, right, right. Like, what what are the differences? So, like, in solute solution, we have alloying of two elements, and in precipitation hardening, for example, we heat up the aluminum and quench it at the first. It doesn't, like, increase the hardness, but, all, like, over time, it increases uh, hardness with precipitates, that's the difference. Uh, if I guess. You're recommending like we have temperature versus time. We increase the specimen's temperature, annihilate it, decrease the temperature, we temper it, and decrease the temperature again. And during these stages, we create precipitations, right? That your answer is sir? like I don't know the exact process, but like I know it happens after uh, quenching and mm -hmm. over time. I guess. Good, good. So this is very good answer, and actually it's correct answer. With alloying, we create different particles. So let's divide particles into two. One is soft particles. For soft particles, they are coherent. Coherent means the dislocation can move through them. So dislocation can move through them. Of course, soft particles are shearable particles. And they are weak particles. And the second group is hard particles. They are not coherent, they are incoherent. That means the dislocation cannot can not move through them, and they are not shearable. And they are hard. They are not weak, they are hard particles. So from solute solution strengthening to precipitation strengthening, actually we are changing the type of particle from soft to hard. We are changing particle or the strengthening methodology from coherent to incoherent. But how can we do that? Basically, we are increasing the size. Or we just increase the aging time, as the result suggested. Aging time. So during heat treatment, if we maximize this process, this aging time, so this is the aging time. If we maximize the aging time, we create larger incoherent particles. But is it always 
good, like the creating these hard particles. They are also called as they are also called as second phase or inclusions, right? Let me also write second phase or inclusions. So inclusion, they strengthen the metal at high temperature. And they are all ceramics. They are very brittle. All right. So the question is, how can dispersed particles influence the strength? What is the methodology? Actually, it's always the same. Anything that blocks the movement of dislocation is a hardening mechanism. And the dispersed particle can increase the strength of a solid by impeding the dislocation motion, right? So the key thing is we have dislocation. If we impede the movement of dislocation, we have hardening. And the particles can be precipitates, and the precipitates are natural. Let me also write pre. They are natural. Or the particles, they can be also things like dispersed oxide or carbide particles during aging, right? Dispersed oxide or carbide. Particles and these are not natural, not necessarily natural. These can be natural, but let me write not necessarily natural. Do you guys remember the phase diagram of iron, uh, iron carbon? Anyone who remembers the phase diagram of iron carbon? Yes, so John, we start with BCC, and as you heat up, it goes to like FCC. Like, good so at room like temperature, it is ferrite, right? It is alpha iron at room temperature, and at high temperature, goes to gamma iron, which is FCC, right? FCC means we have each corner, we have an atom in the unit cell. In each phase, we have an half an atom. And Depending on the cooling time, we can have carbon at the octahedral or tetrahedral sites, which is called as body centered tetragonal, BCT, right? But we also see after heat treatment, we see some cementite. What is the cementite? It is ferrite plus perlite, Ojo. It is iron three carbon, correct? So this is the large particle that we are talking about. 
like the dispersed oxide or the carbide. This is kind of precipitate, which also affects the strength of a material. So particle hardening is generally a more potent way to strengthen the material than solute solution hardening. It's more severe. Precipitates and this these portides are usually more effective barriers to dislocation penetration than single solutes because they are bigger. They are non-shearable. But the question is, do we always get hardening once we increase the size of these precipitates? So the question is basically what determines the degree of strengthening? Basically, we need to care about the particle size. Any idea what, what else determines the degree of strengthening? Mm -hmm. Maybe the volume fraction of particles, right? Can we say time, Ojun? The aging time, of course, it dictates the particle size too. Also the shape, right? Particle shape. Or the structure. of particle and the nature of the interface between the particle and the matrix. And these two, they dictate the mean particle spacing. Mean particle spacing, we call it L. I'll show you the L. So let's say we have different particles here, 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 I'm just putting them randomly. And we have this location. These particles pins the dislocation. Dislocation wants to move, but the particles pin the dislocation. Suppose we, uh, we have this location here, it's moving this way and the particle pins the dislocation line. The L is just the distance between two particles. This is the distance L. Also, we have several angles, for example, here, normal to the dislocation line. We have an angle. Theta C, and this guy right here, let's call it coherent particle C prime. So these are very strong obstacles. The, they pin the dislocation and they create uh, additional strengthening. So normally, like the way this location moves from the particle, if the particle is shearable, so we said the soft particles are shearable. Basically, uh, maybe I can show it in 3D. So maybe these let me just try to draw it this way. Suppose we have a matrix here. And the dislocation is moving through that. So let's say the dislocation moves like this. Once the dislocation 
moves from this particle, it can shear the particle. That means from the top, shear the particle like this, then it cuts the upper part of the particle, then the remaining part is here. This is shearable particle. And this location can shear the particle. But for precipitates, they cannot cut the particle into two and they just, they are just pinned at the particles. These are the two pin points. And they create, like they extrude between particles, which is called as Oroban looping or bowing. And this location need to bypass them. Maybe they might have some loops. So again, if we go to this representation, if we have particles here, let me call, if these are non-shearable particles, precipitate particles, the dislocation will behave like this. Did you guys get the point? The dislocation cannot cut them. All right, so if that is the case, so here we have some force. Applied to the particles. Of course, if we have action, we will have some reaction from the particles, from the precipitates. So this is basic static. Let's call it the tension of particles. P. How can we calculate the force if we apply some shear force? What is the formula of shear force and the shear stress? Resul, what's the formula between shear force and shear stress? Like in general, stress uh -huh. is uh, force divided by area, but good. So here, the length is L. This length is L, and we have just Burger's vector. So the area is B times L. So the force is B times L times the shear stress. Shear stress B times L. And we have two reaction force here. That means two reaction force is equal to tau, let's say tau zero times B times L. Then if we get tau precipitate, that is the stress on precipitate that is derived from line tension. So precipitate is equal to two times this reaction force times B times L, which is more or less equal to some constant G, B, L. So this is the formula that gives the stress on precipitates. Stress on precipitates. So this is basically, let's omit the constant alpha. We have GB over L. So tau max is equal to G times B over L. So we divide obstacles, particles into two. First one is weak. 
second one is strong. So for weak particles, we have solute solution strengthening, or let's say another term is Fidel cutting. Fidel cutting is just if we shear the particles, if we can cut the particles, if we cannot pin the particles by precipitates. Uh, there is like, uh, like this one. This is fetal cutting. But the strong particles we have Oro one looping. We cannot cut the particles. But the interesting thing is if you plot the additional shear stress or strength with respect to the size of particles, we will see that in this region with weak particles, weak precipitates, we will have additional hardening. But after we go to the overage incoherent particles, we will decrease the strength. That means we have some critical size. That is why we need to care about this aging time. We don't want to go to aura one looping. We don't want to go to overage particles. We don't want to go to incoherent particles. We want to stay in the friedel cutting region, coherent particles, and we want to minimize the negative effect of this precipitation hardening. That is why this is your role to decide the aging time and you want to stay on the left-hand side of this region. So if you wait too long, you will lose some strength of your material due to precipitation hardening. That means like this aging also affects the particle distribution, the properties of particles and uh, other other like structure shape volume and size any questions so far any questions so far guys no Jim. perfect so I just want to show you some of my notes, some of the images from my notes. All right. So, shearable particles, non-shearable particles, big particles, small particles, strong particles, co incoherent particles, or coherent particles. So, is this particle shearable or non-shearable? Is it coherent or incoherent particle? Let me show another image. So if the dislocation moves from them, this is shearable particle, okay? If the dislocation can cut the particle, it is shearable particle. If the dislocation are pinned by the particle and cannot shear them, it is non-shearable, incoherent particle. 
now we have some SEM images. Resul, do you think it is shearable or not? This mm -hmm. particle. Shearable. Uh, Ahmet Enes, Ahmet Hakan, what do you guys think? It is shearable. Shearable, shearable right? Perfect. So this is real SEM image. And here we have some non-shearable particles. But here, for example, this is shearable and we have some multiple shear bands. This is also shearable. But this particle was not sheared. So these are weak obstacles compared to non-shearable particles. All right, so we had the iron versus carbon phase diagram. Any alloy, we have some amount of alloying element and some first phase phases like alpha, which is BCC phase, and second phase, like maybe gamma, and also this is liquid phase. In between these two, we have alpha plus liquid or beta plus another phase, whatever this phase it is. And we have alpha plus beta phases. So the room temperature, we have BCC, high temperature phases, basically austenite and so depending on this phase diagram, if you increase the concentration of the solvent, maybe you can create additional phase, which might cause precipitation hardening because the precipitation will dissolve in the host matrix. But if you have only one phase, you all only have solute solution strengthening. If you want to create some precipitates, you can either do heat treatment or change the composition of solvent. This is another very good representation of coherent and incoherent particles. So coherent particle, the dislocation can cut through them. So here, the dislocation comes here and the dislocation can move through them. The dislocation can move through the particle. But if we have some incoherent particles, we have different crystal structure. And as you can see, the dislocation occurs here, but they cannot cut through the particle. The dislocation cannot cut through the paper uh, particle, and they have different crystal orientation. Here, the crystal planes are all lined up. We have only one direction. Look at the bonding. I'm going from here all the way to the down till here. But for the incoherent particle, the direction is this way. But here, I also have uh, other directions, like this guy, like this guy. And semi-coherent is most of the crystal planes are aligned. They are lined up. But in between, we might see some incoherency. This is like a transient particle. Perfect. So, uh, all right. Let me just check if I should go to the Okay, let me just explain 
through this way. So like this location, like solute solution, precipitates can also have stress fields. And once the dislocation stress fields interact with the stress field of this precipitates, we will have some repulsing or attractive field. So if the tensile stress fields of the dislocation interact with the compressive stress field of the precipitates, we have some repulsion. Maybe the precipitate might shield the stress field because they are repelling each other and increase the like the speed of dislocation. But most of the case, precipitates cannot do that. The stress field, the dislocation will interact with the stress field surrounding coherent particles in the same way, the same way that they do with the stress field around the solute atoms, like the solute solution hardening. They mostly pin dislocations and the dislocations cannot cut through them. Therefore, they block the movement of dislocation. But what is the coher coherence strain? So how can we calculate the coherent particles and the stress field around the coherent particles? We said the tensile stress, tensile field of dislocation interact with the strain field of the precipitates and the precipitates reduce the dislocation velocity and they increase the strength of a material. And the result shear stress can be calculated through this formula. The coherent strength is just seven times coherent strain to the power of 1.5 shear modulus times the square root of size of the precipitation, volume fraction of the precipitation divided by Berger's vector. And this coherence strain can be calculated through the size mismatch. This precipitate, any precipitates will expand the lattice and they will create some volume or size mismatch, which can be calculated through the size of precipitate minus the size of matrix divided by the size of the matrix. As you can see, the coherency stress is linearly proportional with R times F divided by B. So if you want to maximize this strength, maybe you can increase the size of precipitation and volume of the precipitation. So the mismatch I'm talking about is this. If the size of the beta phase is less than the size of the alpha phase, we will see that it will not shrink the lattice, but instead it will try to expand the lattice. If it's vice versa, it will try to shrink the lattice. And if you want to calculate the coherence strain, you just need to subtract the size of precipitate from matrix. And you, you need to normalize this term with the size of matrix. Then after you calculate the coherence strain, you just need to put this coherence strain into this equation.
Any questions so far? If not, let's stop at this point. Let's give a five minutes break. And after the break, we will continue. Mehmet, you can uh, just stop. All right, guys, any questions so far? No. So we see that the coherence strain is linearly proportional with the size of precipitation, volume fraction of the precipitates, but the, it is inversely proportional with the Burgers vector. Of course, this is Co for coherent particles. We are firstly talking about the fetal cutting, not aura one looping. This is for coherent particles. And we've seen how to calculate the mismatch between the particles and the lattice itself. So if you remember the solute solution strengthening, we have different mismatch, for example, size mismatch. Another mismatch was the modulus mismatch, right? We have some short order interactions and long, long range interactions, depending on the, how sensitive they are with the temperature. And another mismatch with, between precipitation and the host is modulus. So when a precipitate has a shear modulus, which is different than the matrix modulus, we will have some mismatch. And the line tension is affected by this modulus mismatch. It is basically the same methodology, same idea that we discussed in solute solution hardening. And the modulus change it promotes some local change in the elastic strain energy. And this change in the elastic strain will create additional uh, strength, right? Which is called as the modulus effect. And this G that you see in this yeah. formula is the shear right. modulus. Resun, what's that? Uh, you are not sharing your screen, Ajahn. Like, is it you are not sharing or? Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. All right. All right. So. Modulus mismatch, it also creates additional hardening. And this G term you see here is shear modulus effect. And due to the modulus mismatch, we will have another term, another effect. This is the formula of modulus strengthening. Basically, very similar formula. But this time, the constant is different. 0.1 shear modulus times the modulus mismatch, modulus uh, strain to the power of 1.5 Fr divided by B. And the change in the line tension on cutting dislocation segment can be calculated through this formula. All right, another factor. This, these are only for coherent particles, don't forget, with coherent precipitates. Once we have dislocation, the dislocation cuts the particle and we will have some interface. And this surface energy of NIV interface is different than the previous interface and we need to do some work 
to produce the new surface energy and the strengthening to produce this surface is called as chemical strengthening and the additional stress for chemical strengthening can be calculated through two times g times chemical strain to the power of 1.5 square root fr over b but so it doesn't play very important role once you compare this mechanism this effect with other effect second fault st strengthening once you apply shear loading once the dislocation cuts your particle it will change the stacking sequence the stacking sequence of your precipitates it's like a b a b and you only have a the bonding between a and b planes but once you once the dislocation cuts the precipitate you will form the bonds of AA bonds, here you have some AAs, and here you have some BBs. But this is just single dislocation. The single dislocation, it's in the middle. Once it leaves the precipitate, you will create one Burgers vector from here, another Burgers vector from here. So in this case, here we have unslipped region after dislocation and slipped region, and you have a Burgers vector. Here, after the dislocation exits the precipitate, you will have 2B. And you will have some antiphase boundaries due to the change in second sequence and you form knee bonds, AA bonds and BB bonds. And this change in the second fault will create additional shear stress antiphase boundary effect the shear stress antiphase boundary can be calculated through the shear strain energy of these antiphase boundaries their fraction divided by 2b what if we have two dislocations one single dislocation will change the step and sequence and will create some aa and bb uh, sequence and bonds once the additional the second dislocation comes into the lattice actually the second dislocation return the lattice to its original second sequence once the dislocation for, for example the first dislocation passes this is the second dislocation here you will see only B A, A B, B A, and all. There is no B B or A A bonds. But in between these two, we will have again antiphase boundaries. So first dislocation creates the antiphase boundaries. The second dislocation, they remove the antiphase boundaries and the separation. In between these two dislocations, you will see again some antiphase boundaries, and we will have additional effects due to these antiphase boundaries. All right, you have one dislocation, let's say an edge dislocation. Edge dislocation will decompose into two parts, two segments to shock the partials. First shock the partial, second shock the partial. Another edge dislocation will decompose into two shock the partials, third shock the partial, and fourth shock the partial. In between this, these shock the partials, we will have some antiphase boundaries and 
stacking faults. In between these two Shockley partial, we have stacking faults always and the antiphase boundaries. And in between this second Shockley partial and the third Shockley partial, we will have some antiphase boundaries. Maybe once they meet each other, they can create super dislocation. Super dislocation means like the edge dislocation is one over two, one, one, one. If two edge dislocation comes together and create one full, one, 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 it is called as super dislocation. Actually, I'll explain the strengthening methodology of super alloys. Super alloys, they possess high strength at high temperatures. It is totally related to these antiphase boundaries and super dislocations. But I'll explain that strength in the mechanism later on. But please keep in mind that we have this kind of mechanism. So antiphase boundaries, we have low energies, high energies, small penetration, early stage of precipitation, late stage of precipitation. So these are the all stages, and this is the table that summarizes the additional ordering stress due to antiphase boundaries. But what happens when we lose coherency? How can we lose coherency? How can we produce incoherent particles? Any idea? Actually, like we talked before. Say it again. Uh, increasing by increasing the particle size, maybe. But how can we increase the size of particle? Think about the first class we discussed it before. Anyone? Any good answer? Think about heat treatment. Is it related to aging time? Good. Maybe if you overage your specimen, you can lose coherency. You will increase the size of particle and you will lose your coherence strain. Then we cannot talk about this coherence strain. Then we cannot talk about any type of coherence strain. If we lose coherency, we will form some aura one looping like this. Here, this is just an SEM. We have precipitates and the dislocations, they loop around the Precipitates. This is called as Orovan looping dislocation. We have precipitates and they create looping. This is just one pass, it creates one, one loop. Once the second dislocation pass, it will create another loop like this, like this. All right. So if you recall the formula that we derived before. Where is it? Like the force. All right. The area, so the shear stress is tau BL. We got this formula. How about for Orovan looping? Once we have Orovan looping, The shear stress required to cause bowing is given by tau is g times b over this distance, L minus 2R. But after we form this dislocation loop, you are decreasing this size and you are increasing the 
required shear stress for bowing. So this stress will increase after each loop forms around the particles because you are decreasing the separation distance between them. And you will increase the strength anyway. You will create additional strength. Actually, that was the question. We will increase the strength anyway, but what was what is the mechanism? Why? That is the mechanism. You create one loop and the stress to create another or one loop, this location loop, you need more stress. And you will increase the stress anyway. But of course, the change in the stress will decrease it, once you increase the L prime. And this is the L prime. If you increase L prime, you will decrease the bowing stress. And this is just a representation. If you increase L, you will decrease the hardening. You, you don't want to put too much space into two particles. Also, of course, the volume fraction affects the additional stress. The particle radius affects the stress. And this is the whole idea of precipitation strengthening. We have under edge and over edge particles. For under edge, we have fiddle cutting. For over edge particles, we have Orovan looping. This is the ultimate size that we can get the maximum stress due to precipitation hardening. And yeah, if you increase the particle size, it becomes more difficult for cutting to occur for here. This means additional stress. But if you increase it too much, you will reduce the coherency and uh, you will start losing the losing your additional strength. We just covered this. So if the mean spacing between the particles, which is L prime, increases and it causes the shear stress to decrease, right? This graph right here. If you increase L prime, you will decrease the additional shear stress. So how about if you compare this mechanism with other mechanisms? So these are the hardening mechanisms. We have, we covered the solute solution and we, we've seen that the solute solution is linearly proportional with the square root of C. Think about aluminum with tin. They are linearly proportional with the square root of C, don't forget. But for precipitates, we have weak precipitates, coherent particles. It is more or less same with solute solution. Uh, so their effect is weak. It's more or less similar to, it may be exactly similar to the mechanism as solute solution. But once we have large incoherent particles, the effect is very strong. The additional st stress can be calculated through or row one looping. And if you increase the spacing between them, you will lose some strength. And once you create looping, the dislocation loops, you will decrease the L prime. Once you decrease this distance, you will get additional hardening. So this is all about precipitation hardening. Any question, guys?
Any questions so far? Maybe we, we can discuss. No question. Ahmet Enes, Ahmet Hakan, Ramazan Ünal. Any question? No, hocam. No, hocam. If not, we can call it a day and I'll see you guys next week. See you, hocam. Thank you. Thank you.